So, hi, all wonderful people. Welcome to this webinar. It's dark now in Denmark and Copenhagen. I have to put special lightings on and so on, but we are continuing as possible when possible. I'm Anne Catherine, co founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life, a group of companies that are just dedicated to help um, change health in people's lives through functional medicine and personalized medicine. So, and you are our practitioners, some of you are our friends and hopefully future friends. And remember you have your uh, profile where you can log in and look at supplements. You can look at lab tests. Also the lab tests that we are gonna talk about today uh, in regards to pesticides. So I just wanna um, pay attention or, or bring your attention to something that's actually really interesting. And so some of you were just listening to, to uh, Dr. Shores and, and, and my talk just before uh, I started doing the, the uh, introduction here. And that's the health ownership. Like who owns your health? Is it your doctor that owns your health? Is it your parents that owns your health? Uh, is it the government or is it really you? And we, I'm sure we can all agree to that we own our own health and we are responsible for our own uh, health status. And as practitioners, we are invited in to our patients' lives. We are humble, um, or, or I feel I'm very humble, honored to be invited in to support them in their health journey to help them find clues and ideas as what can support their health uh, optimization journey. Um, but I, I can't be responsible for them doing what I'm suggesting they should do. And I will never know them as well as they know themselves. So, uh, and I just I think it's very, very important that we pass on this message to our patients as well, that we are here to support them, but we don't know them as well as they do. We can help them to get to know themselves better. We can help them do lab tests and so on and understand what goes on. So, but just really to, 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 to give them the power to, to feel and know that N equals one. So they have to really do research in relation to them and not what the government think is uh, right at the moment or not what a research study says right at the moment. Um, we want to invite them to look at the uh, future of medicine and thinking in a detective way and finding clues as what can health optimization, health optimize them here and now. So what uh, Dr. Shaw and I just spoke about was his poor dog that felt awful and it turns out that it was a mold in the dog food. Now, if you just let it up to the vet, he, that probably wouldn't have been found out, but because he's a specialist in mold toxicity, then he found, he worked it out himself. And it's so close to us sometimes, the answer is sometimes right in front of us. So remember that um, I've been on a journey myself the last month where I just had to feel that on my own body. But anyway, so the next webinar will be on the 12th of November and it will be about nutrient testing. And I hope you will join us. So today, the star of the show is Dr. Shaw, who is a board certified, um, who is board certified in clinical chemistry and toxicology. He's the founder of Great Plains Laboratory that runs the test that we are going to talk about today. He's been working for Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He's been working on Children's Mercy Hospital, University of Missouri at Kansas City School of Medicine, and Smith Klein Laboratories as well. He's also authored uh, a couple of books in regards to autism. So, and I met uh, Dr. Shaw perhaps back in 2008 or something in, in Denmark. And I'm just gonna say a little, and this is gonna be a little longer introduction here because today I wrote to, 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 to Dr. Shaw and I said, are you ready? The webinar is in two hours. And he said, what is it about today? And I went, well, it's about pesticides. <laughs> okay, and he's ready. He is so extremely knowledgeable within this field and so experienced that uh, I don't really, he, he, he did his preparation several years ago for this webinar. So anyway, you have the sound, you have the stage, Dr. Shaw, and we are so excited to hear about uh, the next uh, part in regards to pesticides. Okay, and, and you need to activate the screen sharing. Oh. You have it disabled. Yeah. And so that. you just need to put um, enable screen sharing. There you go. Make co-host. Sorry about that. Okay. 
And there we go. Yay. And Remember, everybody, we are recording and we will um, share it as soon as we can. I will okay. mute myself now. I'm going to talk about a, a, uh, the development of this test, what my motivation was in, in developing this is that I felt that there was not uh, any testing available uh, that was suitable for screening for most of the uh, chemicals to which we're exposed. And I, I felt that there are so many people whose illness was due to exposure to common chemicals uh, in the environment. And, and, and no one seemed to uh, uh, realize that, that, that uh, anything that goes, uh, that you breathe in, uh, anything that uh, touches your skin uh, can rapidly be absorbed through your skin and cause toxicity. And of course, anything you eat. So it's anything you can breathe, anything you can touch with your skin, and anything you eat that's contaminated can cause problems. And of course, uh, toxic chemicals have, have uh, been a problem with mankind probably since the uh, the uh, Roman times when uh, the Romans used uh, lead lining for their uh, uh, their pipes that brought water into their uh, communities and and so many of the uh, many of the uh, Romans became uh, lead uh, contaminated and but the contamination of the environment has really accelerated since the beginning of the 1900s and and now, of course, it is uh, the amount of the contamination is gigantic. So uh, that's why for choosing this uh, this uh, uh, dry suit to the person going into this giant uh, uh, wave of toxic chemicals. And, and. So uh, a, a Dr. Doris Rapp has written uh, multiple books on, on uh, toxic exposures and how chemicals can affect the behavior of children and ADHD. And, and, uh, and so she has some very thick books on, uh, that are still uh, available, uh, Amazon and, um, and perhaps on her own website on uh, toxic chemicals. So in the United States, more than a billion pounds of toxic chemicals released into the water and air in just a single year, more than 80,000 in use in the United States. But of those, only less than 10% have had any safety evaluation. So 90% of all the chemicals that we're exposed to, there is no, um, there, there's no safety evaluation. And even those that have been evaluated, the, the, the majority of these are tested only on healthy young males uh, because there's concern that, uh, that if they were, if females were exposed, they might be pregnant and then cause a, a, a abnormality in the developing child. And there's also a consideration that uh, most people won't, uh, don't want to have their children tested to see uh, if there's toxicity. So, um, so there's only very limited information on more than 10% um, uh, uh, and 90% with no safety. Oh, so some of the sources for uh, toxic chemicals are uh, insecticides are one of the one of the first ones, but also weed killers have become a very prominent, especially in our our food crops. So if the uh, weed killers are sprayed uh, onto the food crops uh, so that the uh, nutrients in the soil uh, go preferentially to the to the food. However, uh, all those chemicals from the weed killers go into the um, go in, into the uh, food as well. 
And so in addition to the nutrients, anytime these weed killers are used, they're going into the food and there are not something you can, you can wash off. You know, many people think, well, oh, if I just wash the food, they, no, you can't do that because these chemicals are absorbed through the roots and they're distributed all throughout the food. So there's, there's no way that you can uh, remove these chemicals. Um, the only chemicals you can remove are those that were uh, sprayed on the food on the surface of the uh, food plant shortly before harvest, but these weed killers are not in that category. And so if you don't eat organic food, you are being exposed. So I've, I feel like my work has been, uh, has been uh, recognized because I was just notified Monsanto wants to uh, subpoena me to talk about a, a court case in which a person is saying their cancer was caused by the lyphosate. So, so I feel a little bit intimidated because Monsanto has the uh, is well known for sending people to follow you around to intimidate you and things like that. So, I so I feel that uh, that my company has done well and that it has gotten the attention of Monsanto, but in but I'm a little bit intimidated by their uh, reputation. Uh, so uh, solvents are, are uh, a common source uh, of uh, toxic chemical cleaning agents and soap. Uh, so many people don't realize it, but the probably the most toxic thing you have is right in your, in your uh, bathroom, the uh, antibacterial soap that you may be using to wash your hands are even worse. If you shower with these antibacterial soaps, all those chemicals are gonna be absorbed through your skin. And virtually all of these have significant uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, plastics, uh, carpets, drapes, clothes. So almost everything synthetic has the ability to, to, uh, to expose you to toxic uh, chemicals, uh, germicides. So now of course, all of these things to protect you against the COVID, you have to worry about, uh, they may be harmful to the COVID, but they may also be harmful to you as well. So it's something you really need to check out. Uh, drugs, of course, uh, are now known to contaminate. All, all our streams are, are contaminated. And of course, the streams then go and, and are used to water the plants in the field. And so uh, pharmaceutical drugs may be in, in water, but in all the food we eat as well uh, due to um, the huge amounts. And, and one of the big ones, of course, are the uh, estrogens because so many women use birth control pills that uh, the, the amount of estrogens in some of the streams are so high that uh, the uh, fish and, and frogs are, are all turning to into the female sex because of the high uh, estrogen in the uh, water. Uh, plants, food, water, air. So, uh, so virtually everything in your environment is uh, potential exposure. And, and this is something that the vast majority of the medical community doesn't know about. And, and that's another thing I have to fight sometimes for workers who've been exposed to these things. And even their, the physicians that are supposed to be in charge of this uh, don't have adequate knowledge about the extent to which these chemicals can cause uh, workers to have problems. Uh, so, the, so one of my goals was is to develop a a, a test that would ch check for a wide number of chemicals because there were companies that would check one chemical at a time, but like each test would be $100. So if you were checking uh, 200 chemicals, it would cost you $20,000 and you wouldn't know which ones to test for anyway, because most, pe most people don't know all the things unless you're you know, if you're working in a factory that is using a particular chemical, well, then you may know the name of that one chemical, 
but virtually no one knows all the chemicals they're exposed to because they're so widely used. And so the goal was to screen a wide range of chemicals uh, in a single urine sample and at a good price. And so this is what the GPL tox came, came for, the, uh, uh, a, a, a test that will, that's very easy to collect. You just need a morning urine sample and, and, um, and you send it in and we test it and, and we have uh, normal ranges for, for um, virtually the whole United States. And even though there may be some <clears throat> differences in other countries, they're relatively small because when we test, you know, test like virtually every person in the United States, all different uh, nationalities and ethnicities, we get a pretty wide um, uh, sample. So you don't have to worry about the uh, ranges. The ranges are very suitable. And we also use the uh, uh, combination of liquid chromatography with, uh, with uh, it's called triple quad mass spec which is the, by far the most sensitive as well as the most accurate methods for detecting a wide range of toxic chemicals. And the test includes a very good marker for mitochondrial damage called tigleal uh, glycine. It's a phase two uh, detoxification product that is seen uh, in people who have mitochondrial disease but also if they have mitochondrial disease that's due to exposure uh, to toxic chemicals. And this pairs very well with the organic acid test, which has another marker of toxicity, succinic acid. So the combination of succinic acid together with tigleoglycine is a very good uh, overall assessment for uh, toxicity. So, uh, this is, is from a, the, uh, a, a scholar in the past saying that all substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. So anything can be a poison. So a few years ago, there was a case where they were having a contest of who could drink the most water. And one of the people at the radio station drank a bunch and, and she died from water toxicity because it caused swelling of her brain, which ended up killing her. So anything can be a poison if the amount is too much. So, uh, so looking at these uh, list of lethal doses of uh, different chemicals, uh, you see water at the top. It's the least toxic, but if you go to 100,000 milligrams of water per, uh, per kilo of body weight, you can, you can be dead from that. And of course, ethyl alcohol is one that commonly uh, college students make the stupid idea of thinking that this may be a good idea to see who can drink the most alcohol at one time. And, I, and as a toxicologist, a number of cases that this has uh, uh, led to death. Uh, and then as you go down, uh, DDT, cyanide, uh, uh, people who smoke don't realize nicotine is one of the, uh, an extremely toxic uh, chemical in addition to being a, stent, a stimulant and botulinum toxin. And of course now, People are, you know, using it on the as an anti-aging uh, thing, and even as a, a drug. But it's extremely uh, toxic. Uh, pyrethrins are a common thing. You can look on. Got this just from the uh, surfing the internet, and uh, the pyrethrins were first developed by the Chinese, who found that certain flowers had chemicals that would um, reduce insects in their houses. And, and, uh, and so even, even those uh, natural products from flowers do have some toxicity for uh, humans. So if you were exposed to too much of them, they could cause toxicity as well. 
but the chemist uh, went back and, and modified the chemicals found in flowers to make them even more uh, toxic for, uh, so they are killing insects. And, and, uh, and so one of the common things, of course, the, the dogs uh, having fleas and, and uh, ticks, and so develop shampoos that have pyrethrins and, and uh, in the pyrethrin, uh, the, some of the insects uh, developed resistance uh, to this particular chemical and the insects break uh, detoxify using the same kind of systems humans and other animals use called cytochrome P450. There's about a hundred different uh, enzymes in mammals that detoxify various chemicals. So the, the people who make these pet shampoos put in piperineal butoxide. It's an inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 in the insects. Unfortunately, it's also an inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 in dogs and cats and humans. And so uh, it makes these chemicals more toxic to humans as well. And so a study was done by an autism research group in the United States and found mothers exposed to pet shampoos, which are almost all of these pyrethrins were twice as likely to have a child with autism and they were especially vulnerable if they were washing their pets in the second trimester. Um, and other people, even though they're less toxic than other uh, pesticides, there have been cases of people who uh, gave their dog a bath and then they uh, died of a, a heart attack uh, within minutes of the washing because the, these chemicals are toxic to humans as well as to fleas and insects. So uh, pesticides uh, are applied through, they, they call this uh, a fogging technique and, and, uh, and they can be uh, spread. And unfortunately, the, uh, even farms that have, that are organic, meaning they don't use uh, pesticides and herbicides can be exposed because when the farmer uh, next to them uh, puts out all these uh, chemicals, they, they can, wind can blow this as far as 20 miles away. And so the uh, organic form next to this could be contaminated. I talked to a, uh, a woman who's, uh, who had an organic farm with her husband and uh, her husband went out to uh, plow the fields and his neighbor was using these pesticides and, and uh, so when he came back in, he washed all off and everything. But in the morning, uh, when he woke up, you could see a yellow outline of his body on the sheets of the bed um, because all the stuff was uh, outgassing uh, through his skin during the night. So, so even a person who is taking uh, care uh, on an organic farm can be exposed. That said, the organic food is still on, even if there's some contamination, it's less contaminated than food that has uh, these chemicals directly sprayed on them. A study uh, had been done in Mexico where they were comparing children in, uh, who were very similar, the same ethnic background, uh, but one of them lived in the, one group was in the valley. Uh, the valley was very flat and so was, was uh, very amenable for, to farming. Uh, on the, uh, the sides of the mountains, it was very rocky and so it was unsuitable for agriculture. And so the children who lived in the valley had a lot of pesticide and herbicide exposure. Those who lived up in the uh, foothills of the mountains where it was rocky uh, had very little exposure and they, they had them do a test and the motivation was whoever jumped up and down the longest got a candy bar or something like, uh, something like that. And, and uh, they found that the, the children in the valley 
had very little physical endurance because of the pesticide exposure. They also gave them a simple mental task, which was to draw a picture of a, a stick man. And the children who were not exposed to the pesticides could easily do this, but the children exposed to pesticides could only put a only do a very simple figure, you know, just the just the head and the body, and would not we're not putting in the details of the uh, the eyes, the mouth, and the and the arms and legs. So very interesting. Uh, they also found that they were much more uh, the subject to temper, temper tantrums and, and, and uh, aggression to their brothers and sisters. So uh, anytime they, uh, the brothers and sisters came by, they were starting fights and everything. Uh, but the children who uh, didn't have the pesticide exposure were free of these uh, behaviors. Uh, an another uh, place. Uh, this is the Central Valley of California, which is the most intensive agriculture uh, area in the United States. I, uh, I lived there for one summer as a uh, uh, as a uh, teenager, and the hobby uh, there was finding rattlesnakes at, at night because the the rattlesnakes. Uh, uh, would come out onto the roads to uh, stay warm. And so you could, uh, you could uh, drive around in your car looking for uh, rattlesnakes. Uh, and, and, uh, and so this area is, is like the breadbasket of one of the breadbaskets of the United States. And probably a lot of this is shipped to other countries as well. And they found that people lived in this area uh, had were much more likely uh, to develop a form of autism called pervasive developmental disorder. If they had pesticides that had chlorine atoms added, uh, they were even uh, more uh, toxic. And these are compounds. This is relevant because uh, there was they caused a sevenfold autism rate, but it's also found that. Uh, they cause, can cause severe acne. This is one of the things one of the spies had, uh, had uh, from the KGB had poisoned one of the uh, Ukrainian ministers and the person developed extremely severe uh, acne. And we had a case yesterday in which uh, the person had uh, uh, severe acne. So this can be a cause of this, these pesticides. In the United States, it's a common thing to use this thing called house tinting if there's um, um, if there's a severe exposure. Like one of the things, if the house has termites, um, or uh, in some in one cases there was. Uh, uh, I knew the vice president of one of the pesticide companies, and he told me uh, the story about they had a. Uh, a marketing program such that if, if they came out and sprayed your house and you had any bugs afterward, they had a money back guarantee. They would come back and keep spraying it uh, until there were no more insects. And so a couple said, oh, they had had some cockroaches and, and, um, and, and uh, they called up and said, we want you to uh, do this, and they came out and did the regular spraying. It didn't do any good. They had to spray again, and it still uh, still had insects. And so they they said, "Well, because you've had so much, we're going to do this house tenting thing for you." They covered the entire house with this giant tent. They open all the windows and doors, and they have a truck come in that has a giant fogging device, such that the chemical permeates every square inch of the uh, house. And, and, um, and they said, well, because this is so contaminated, you and your husband can go, uh, we'll pay for a hotel room for tonight. And then you can come back and they, you know, we'll take the tent down and you can come back. And so they came back and 
the next day at work, uh, they were very reliable employees, but neither one showed up for work. And, and then the next day, neither one showed up for work, didn't call in. And so they sent the police out and they found the couple were dead in their bed from the pesticide. Um, and, and so they, the company was uh, sued for millions of dollars for uh, the death. So, uh, so be sure to take uh, very good care when you're doing these things. If you have insects, the safest thing to do are these traps where the pesticide stays inside the trap and it has uh, 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 things that attract the insects to go into the trap. And so that way the, the pesticide is, doesn't uh, uh, contaminate your house. Uh, at the bottle of bottles, and I don't know if they, if they uh, uh, do this, I think they do it in other countries. I know they do it in the United States. Uh, at the bottom of plastic bottles, they have these triangle things uh, which have different numbers in them. And uh, using these numbers, you can figure out what, uh, what particular chemicals are in the plastic. So uh, this one is in, in uh, soft drink, water, salad dressings, peanut butter, and it commonly uses uh, arsenic in the manufacturing. So you could have, uh, there are no phthalates in there, but there are, could be arsenic. Uh, uh, numbers, if you want to remember numbers, two, four, and five are considered uh, the safe uh, numbers. If you look on the bottom of your uh, bottles, they are very small. So sometimes you have to hold the bottle up to the light. And sometimes they're in the center. Sometimes they're on the bottom uh, edge of the bottle. Uh, so number three uh, th can be uh, phthalates, vinyl chloride, and dioxins can form if they're burned. Uh, dioxins are the chemical that the KGB uh, used on the Ukrainian um, politician and uh, uh, nearly uh, killed him and caused the, uh, he had beautiful skin before the KGB poison then had uh, really severe uh, acne after being exposed to the uh, dioxins. Uh, four is considered safe. Uh, 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 five is considered safe. Uh, six, it has styrene that leaches out from cups. And uh, seven has the very toxic bisphenol A. So you don't want to be using uh, products that have uh, uh, that. So remember again, two, four, and five safe. The other numbers, uh, different toxic chemicals. Uh, in in our test, what we do is we uh, measure monoethyl phthalate, which comes from diethyl phthalate, is one of the most common plasticizers used in plastics, and and it's broken down in the body to monoethyl phthalate. Uh, so there's no monoethyl phthalate in Plastic. So if you see monoethyl phthalate in the urine, it means that you were exposed to uh, diethyl phthalate. Uh, there's also some exposure to uh, the, this part of the molecule be removed forming uh, phthalic acid as well. So phthalates are found in almost everything in our modern uh, environment. Uh, plastics, uh, virtually all cosmetics. So, so one of the things I recommend if people have high phthalates, especially women who use uh, more uh, cosmetics than uh, men that to get rid of the stuff that many times you, you need to get rid of your cosmetics. A number of companies have started up uh, with organic products. So you just need to they're more expensive, like that's always the case. Uh, on the other hand, they are not gonna cause, cause you problems. And of course, this is very important for, as far as fertility because the phthalates cause damage to uh, developing embryos. So, so uh, any woman who is, uh, wants to be pregnant needs to be avoiding uh, all the uh, uh, cosmetics 
And uh, in addition to cosmetics, many of the pharmaceuticals are, have high amounts of these things because they use them as time release agents. So they, they bind the drugs so that it's not released all at one time. And unfortunately, these are loaded with phthalates. The, the record high value was, was a, a, a person who was testing, taking a uh, over-the-counter, meaning a non-prescription uh, drug. And this is from the uh, CDC National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey who found this more than two orders of magnitude, more, so more than a hundred times the a normal value, a um, hundred times the 95th percentile. So this is very important. So on the, our, the Great Plains test, you'll see the 95th percentile if your value or your patient's value is higher than the 95th percentile, it means that likely this is having a negative impact on your health. And if the value is less than that, it means it's possible. But if the thing is multiples, like in this case, it was more than 100 times the 95th percentile, uh, that means extremely, extremely toxic, meaning almost surely uh, this is the cause of the person's uh, health problem. This is interesting to me because this was the place where uh, I first worked when after getting my PhD, got my PhD test passed on Friday and went to work at CDC on uh, Monday. And, uh, and so we used the data from this survey. They developed normal ranges for, for um, for 95% of the chemicals we test, we use the NHANES data, which is based on uh, several thousand uh, people. So it's a very uh, reliable, normal range. Uh, phthalates are likely responsible for the uh, decline in testosterone values. Uh, so in the city of Boston, they found that uh, men are uh, continually uh, lowering their, their uh, testosterone values and that, uh, and, and uh, men who had testosterone measured in the past had much higher testosterone values than uh, men today. And it was found that the uh, phthalates were found in almost every single person of a group of nearly 3,000 uh, people. And it was also found that uh, men who use the most uh, cosmetic type things like aftershave or cologne had the highest uh, level of um, phthalates. And, and perhaps I put in is that maybe this was the, uh, in the, this was a popular topic of the metrosexuals, um, the uh, the, uh, the men who were not doing the rugged outdoor stuff anymore, that there could be something to that, that, that is the uh, lowering of testosterone by phthalates. Uh, so here's an example from a, uh, a painter. This is an artist who has extreme uh, fatigue. And this is uh, very good because it shows the patient's value is in this middle gray section. And you see the result is in micrograms per gram of creatinine. And this is from the uh, normal ranges are based on the NHANES at the Center for Disease Control. And you see we have the LLOQ, the lower limit of quantitation. So, so really excellent values would be, really healthy values would be in the green and the unhealthy values are as it moves into the red. And so the most unhealthy is if the value, if the bar goes past the 95th percentile. Um, in this particular case, the, uh, the 95th percentile is right here. You can see the black bar goes beyond it. And the 95th percentile is written just below it is 850. So this person's value is 19,000. So what I suggest, 
you have a little calculator, divide 19,000 by 850, you get the person is 22, more than 22 times the 95th percentile. So without a doubt, I can say that the person's fatigue was due to the exposure to the phthalates, probably because of um, uh, solvents and probably also do the habit of sometimes artists will put the paintbrush in their mouth to uh, straighten the bristles. And there may be, there may have been other sources as well. It could have been they were also taking uh, over the counter drugs that had uh, phthalates. So without this test, there's no way this person would have ever found out the reason for uh, her particular uh, fatigue. Uh, this is a uh, another case, and uh, we offer the testing. I think it's in ten languages, and so this one is in Spanish. In Spanish, they spell phthalates with a ft instead of a ph, uh, and her value. Uh, let's see if I can move that again. You know, the upper limit of normal is eight fifty. Hers was thirty eight thousand. Uh, so 45 times the 95th percentile. So once you go up to the 95th percentile or one, two, but if you get to 20 or 30 or 40 times, the, there's no doubt that that is the, the maiden cause of their particular uh, problem, which in this case was uh, severe tremors. Uh, and then at the, at the bottom of each report is, uh, is an ex, a brief explanation. And then there's like a more extended uh, uh, description explanation at the end. But we have like a brief report next to each of the uh, markers. Uh, phthalates are, are associated with autism spectrum disorders, the higher the values, the more likely the child is to have autism. And the uh, phthalates are, have also been uh, uh, implicated in ADHD, attention deficit with hyperactivity. They actually found in this case, it was due to the medical intervention the children had. So they found children with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity were uh, premature children who were given a lot of intravenous uh, uh, supplements when when they were uh, when when they were babies in the neonatal intensive care, and all this uh, plastic tubing had extensive amounts of phthalates, and so these children uh, still had elevated amounts of phthalates five years. Uh, after they were exposed when they were babies and, and so had to have these phthalates removed uh, and, and, uh, and to treat their attention deficit with hyperactivity. Uh, also, the phthalates affect the uh, children's sexuality. It's thought that the high levels of phthalates are associated with the premature breast development in young girls. It's been a common observation that girls are entering puberty and developing the secondary sexual characteristics at an increasingly younger age. And uh, these toxic chemicals are probably one of the ones. And, and for men, they're doing the opposite. They're causing the, uh, the uh, lower testosterone, uh, low sperm count, low uh, sperm motility. motility. Uh, women who have high amounts of phthalates in their urine in pregnancy were much more likely to give birth to boys with smaller uh, scrotums and, and uh, uh, that uh, women who had high phthalates in their breast milk were likely to have uh, male children with low testosterone. And one of the main sources of this is actually our medical devices. So. So it's interesting that this is probably one case where the integrative physicians are probably maybe responsible for some of the chemical intoxication because they, these plastic bags and the plastic tubing 
uh, have a high amount of toxic chemicals such as phthalates and polyvinyl chloride. So one of the things you should do if you're a practitioner who uses these things like for vitamin C infusions or, or other infusions of vitamins is to, uh, is to use glass containers or will be uh, much better, uh, much healthier for the patient. Uh, children sometimes have exposure to more, to more chemicals because they're, they're uh, especially if they're crawling, they're crawling on the floors and become uh, exposed to chemicals like phthalates that way. Uh, here's an example of a solvent, uh, xylene, so uh, in showing its metabolism. So xylene is a common chemical found in uh, indoor paint. Uh, so uh, here's xylene, it has a six-membered ring, which is called the benzene ring, which has two methyl groups attached to it. And uh, in a phase one reaction in the body, uh, xylene is uh, oxidized by a P450 enzyme to form uh, toluic acid. Toluic acid uh, reacts with, in a phase two reaction with glycine uh, in the liver to form methyl hypuric acid, uh, which, which we can uh, test. Uh, the, I mentioned the source of the reference ranges were my old first employer the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Uh, the, they use the data from this survey to recommend a vitamin supplementation for breakfast cereals in uh, the United States. They, your water can be sometimes a major source of uh, contamination. So this is one of the expensive uh, beef, uh, not beef, beach communities in California, just, just outside Los Angeles. Uh, you know, all these houses along the, the cheapest house along the beach is, you know, uh, is more than a million dollars, but all their water was contaminated by a chemical called MTBE because the because the uh, gas stations uh, contaminated the water. So I, I don't know which ones they were. I'm just using this as an example. I don't know if it was Shell or not, but there were several different uh, companies that uh, where the uh, water had uh, leaked. And for some reason, it doesn't want to go forward. Let's see if I can. Um, hmm. Hmm. Let's see. Just took a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I may have to. You might just have to jump out of the share. Yeah, I may have to jump out and then get yeah. back in. That's yeah. No stress. Let's see. Ah, there. Oh, okay. So, so when you, uh, what happens is gas stations have these big uh, metal tanks underground that provide the gasoline to the gas pumps. But after a period of time, they rust because they're, there's a, you know, they're steel and eventually they rust. And when they rust, the holes develop and the, uh, the MTBE is a gasoline additive and it, it uh, comes out and then it contaminates the groundwater and it's very water soluble. So if there's any groundwater, if there's any underground streams under the gas station, pretty soon it will distribute it. And that's what happened. Virtually the entire uh, community, all the source of water was uh, contaminated and it 
all the water had bad taste. So even the people who had million dollar houses, they had uh, they they had to pay tons of money to uh, to to have uh, uh, suitable drinking water. And actually, we found. So what they did is the, the, the companies were, were sued by the city who, who said that um, uh, they agreed to a thing in which they, the, they had new sources of water from outside the area that would bring water in. But what they did is they did. They just mixed it with the contaminated water. They didn't just use the purified water. They just diluted it with the contaminated water. And so we recently tested somebody who lived there, and they still had the uh, a teenage girl was having problem with seizures and attention deficit, and had extremely high values of the MTBE. Uh, and uh, uh, Europe uses not MTBE, they use ETBE, which does almost exactly the same thing. It's the typical thing. When a chemical company is accused of a toxic chemical, they, may, they slightly modify the chemical and, and they put out a new chemical that's almost just as toxic as the previous one, but it takes you know roughly another 10 years before the environmentalists are able to prove it. So they look like they have a 10 year window uh, of uh, uh, when they produce a new chemical before people find out about it. So M MTBE, which is used widely in the United States and ETBE is now being exported, I think from my understanding all over uh, Europe. Uh, it's carcinogenic, causes nausea, drowsiness, vomiting, a burning sensation, uh, CNS, problems, uh, tremors, ataxia, meaning uh, difficulty with walking and dizziness uh, and uh, attention deficit as well. So both of these chemicals are converted uh, into the same chemical, which we measure at Great Plains 2-hydroxy isobutyrate is both ETBE and MTBE. And they, these are one they make the uh, improve what is called the octane rating, meaning the, the explosions that happen in the engine of your car that make your car engine run. Um, unfortunately, these things um, get into the environment and cause contamination. So this is a, a five-year-old with autism and uh, has high amounts so what we do for each of the, first we measure the thing, we indicate the thing being measured, which is the metabolite of MTBE, but down below we put the parent. The parent means the chemical from which the metabolite came. And you see the child with autism has two and a half times the 95th percentile, likely indicating that this is at least partially responsible for some of the autistic symptoms. Um, the same child also has high values of phenylglyoxylic acid, which comes from styrene, which is another uh, gasoline uh, metabolite. We had one of the people who said, I don't understand how I got this thing. Where am I getting all this exposure to gasoline? Well, it ended up she had, uh, she lived on the second floor above a motorcycle repair shop on the first floor and all the fumes were coming into her apartment uh, just above that. Uh, and uh, this, the child also had high amounts of, of this weed killer. It's called uh, 2,4-D uh, and the long name 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. And of course, since this is a chlorinated compound, this is one that could cause uh, the uh, acne. Uh, when uh, so any chlorinated hydrocarbon, uh, chlorinated, brominated, or fluorinated hydrocarbons can cause this uh, uh, acne. It was a, a weapon used by the United States against Vietnam. The country of Vietnam says that there's probably four and a half million people who have uh, severe health 
uh, uh, problems due to this uh, spraying of virtually the entire country of Vietnam with this particular chemical. Uh, and the child has very high levels of tiglucosine, indicating a the chemicals are causing severe mitochondrial dysfunction. So the upper limit of normal was two. So the child's is 14 times the upper limit of normal. Uh, so, uh, so there's little doubt in my mind that as far as this child is concerned, probably the major cause of autism uh, in this child is the uh, chemical uh, exposure. Uh, and, and there's one additional marker, the vinyl chloride was also very elevated. So the child had around five different chemicals uh, that were above the 95th percentile. Here's the structure of tigliglycine. Uh, again, it's a phase two chemical. Tiglic acid uh, reacts with glycine in the phase two reaction in the liver to form tigliglycine. Uh, and uh, this is the biochemical pathway. And you know, you, I don't want anybody to try to memorize this and, or anything like that, but it comes from the tiglic acid comes from the branch chained amino acids that eventually are uh, metabolized in the mitochondria. But if there are toxic chemicals there, the mitochondrial respiratory chain called complex one. It's the complex one is the part of the mitochondria that produces ATP. It's damaged by toxic chemicals. And so uh, this reaction uh, doesn't function. So instead uh, the reaction reverses and instead of the, the chemicals moving in this direction, they, they move the reverse direction and form high amounts of tigliglycine. Uh, here's a 57-year-old woman with uh, chronic fatigue, high uh, xylene, and, and we found out what the cause is. She painted her apartment, the whole inside of her apartment. It was the winter time, so you don't want to paint your, your uh, house or apartment in the winter time because you, you, you aren't gonna be opening your, your doors and windows to let the fumes out. So if you're gonna be doing this, the best time to do it is in the very moderate winter, a late spring, early fall, or, uh, or, or mild days in the, in the summer. So that was her problem. The way these things are treated is um, the most effective way of, of treating this is sauna. So sauna is the way to do this. And that's, of course, that's a very popular Scandinavian activity. So, so, uh, so you folks are, 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 uh, are some of the most prepared people in the world for dealing with uh, toxic uh, chemicals because sauna is the most effective way of getting rid of it. Uh, here's a, the same uh, woman uh, with the high xylene when we did the organic acid test. You can see it's also affecting her lactic acid. The lactic acid is very elevated and succinic acid is elevated. Succinic acid is, is one of the best markers for toxicity on the organic acid test. And the reason is because it's the, uh, the most important mitochondrial uh, enzyme is succinic dehydrogenase. Uh, so 2,4-D is not approved for use on lawns and gardens in some of the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, Kuwait, and some of the Canadian uh, provinces, but it's used throughout the world and uh, used really throughout the United States. And that's been one of the problems with the Trump administration is they they've been completely against any um, regulation of uh, toxic pesticides. They, they really allow the chemical companies to write their own regulations. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so uh, these chemicals are very widely used. 
And one of the latest, they combine 2,4-D with glyphosate. So they make a very toxic um, cocktail, which is then present in all the foods on which it's uh, used in the fields. So here's the Enlist Duo herbicide. It's glyphosate plus the 2,4-D. Here's a 24-year-old uh, male had high values. And he said, how can that be? Uh, Australia bans this. Well, Australia bans certain uh, subtypes of it, but they did not ban it all. So he had the kind that wasn't banned. Uh, this is the chemical structure, and you can see it has uh, the two chlorine atoms attached to the uh, benzene ring, and that's that's what causes a lot of the toxicity. It's what causes the uh, the chemical uh, acne in some people. Uh, this is a 62-year-old uh, female with uh, Huntington's dis uh, that uh, neurologic disease. We're not sure if it's hunting disease or hunting disease-like, but she has dementia, mood swings, uh, ataxia, meaning problems with balance, uh, uh, chronic pain, and uh, and kind of spastic movements. Uh, she had very high amount of the chemical uh, from propylene uh, oxide, which is used in a number of industrial things but she had other toxic chemicals as well, high amounts of acrylamide. And we're not measuring acrylamide itself, of course, we're measuring its metabolite, which is an N-acetyl derivative. Um, one thing I wanna point out is that in acetyl, you see the words N-acetyl and cysteine in this. This is not the N-acetyl cysteine in a supplement, this is just a coincidence that um, this is a glutathione uh, adduct. And, and so these uh, number of toxic uh, breakdown products of glutathione have the words acetyl and cysteine in them. Uh, she also had high amounts of butadiene and uh, one of the pesticides or organophosphates, diethylphosphate. So she had four different toxic chemicals that were over the 95th percentile. Uh, this one, double, triple, almost triple, and double. Uh, so all of these things, there wasn't a single thing, it was a combination of things that were causing her problem. So these kind of tests are very important for people who have illnesses that are kind of a mystery, or the person has been sick for a long time and we had you haven't found out the reason, that's when you bring out things like the GPL tox and the uh, mycotoxin test for mold. Uh, so when we looked at the organic acid test of this woman, um, she had that four of the six markers of the Krebs cycle were all elevated. And in addition, there's two amino acid metabolites that are also produced in the mitochondria and they were also elevated. So she had six different markers of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, 2,4-D, I, I mentioned this, used in uh, Vietnam. And so a lot of the uh, soldiers who worked with this stuff also had a number of, of uh, uh, problems later on in life, likely due to exposure to this uh, uh, chemical. Uh, men who worked with this are, can also have abnormal shaped sperm, impaired fertility. ALS, the neuro, a very uh, uh, fatal uh, neurologic disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's called locked-in syndrome because at the end, the person can only move their eyes. All their uh, muscles become paralyzed. Uh, they had more exposure to um, 2,4-D. Uh, when given to animals, it caused all kinds of problem, behavioral and neurologic problems uh, with the animals. Uh, 
if the person has a really severe exposure, really high values, there are medical things that can be done, like giving the person high amounts of bicarbonate uh, that make the urine alkaline. It will cause a very rapid uh, decrease. But this probably is only something with somebody who had a very severe you know, if the value were like 50 times the limit of normal or something like that, you might want to consider giving the person uh, bicarbonate to, to cause the pH of the urine to become alkaline. That causes a more uh, up to a 60-fold increase in the rate of elimination. So this is a, a, a kid, a baseline sample of a three-year-old with autism, another case in which uh, autism is, was almost surely caused by the toxic chemical exposure. And actually this kid is one that, you know, they might have used the uh, accelerated method, uh, but I think I didn't know about it when I first encountered this family. So the child's value the, is, um, 56, the, uh, the 95th percentile is near two. So the value is 28 times the 95th percentile. And, um, and so they put the child for an hour, did sauna for three months, an hour a day. And at the end of that time, there was none of the chemicals still remaining. It was all, had all disappeared. There was none detected and they had a significant improvement in the autism symptoms. Uh, this is the same three-year-old with the organic acid test prior to the sauna, uh, and the succinic acid is 21 times the upper limit of normal. So again, uh, four of the six Krebs cycle markers elevated, and the uh, one of the amino acid uh, mitochondrial markers elevated. And, um, and we'll compare that to a, a, uh, a man who has a, uh, a genetic uh, disease, excuse me, went too fast, a genetic disease called uh, uh, kearns uh, Sayre syndrome, which is a uh, mitochondrial disorder. So, the, so this person with a genetic disease of the mitochondria you see the succinic acid is 17 times the upper limit of, of uh, normal, and that's compared to the child with the, <clears throat> the 2,4-D uh, exposure who had 21 times the upper limit of normal. So the chemical exposure can cause damage to the mitochondria equivalent to a severe genetic disorder. And th this is the reason why succinic acid is so important. And it's because the, the enzyme that breaks down succinic acid, succinic dehydrogenase, is the only enzyme that is both part of the Krebs cycle uh, and the electron transport chain. So it has dual function. It's involved in it making ATP but it's also involved in the conversion of succinate to fumarate. Uh, this enzyme is on the is located on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is the uh, Krebs cycle, uh, also known as the citric acid cycle. And so I have to tell the little story. Um, the uh, we were doing an autism conference and we were. Uh, uh, we, we, the, the people were coming in, we we're checking off their names on the name list against their badges. And one of the people was named Krebs. So as a joke, I had said, oh, you must be, must have been your father who discovered the Krebs cycle, right? And he said, of course not. It was my grandfather who had done it. So, so that was something. So we had the grand grandson of the Nobel Prize winner coming to, uh, to my uh, lecture about the Krebs cycle. Uh, this again, showing the Krebs cycle going on inside the mitochondria. And now uh, the final 
thing is uh, glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate comes in. Everybody wants to say glyphosate. And so 98%, and so it took me a long time to say it. So the right way of saying it is glyphosate. And, but it's a combination of uh, glycine and phosphate. It's the one that is produced by Monsanto and it's got them into multi-billion dollar lawsuits in the United States. And so the, you know, it, the uh, Monsanto was bought out by Bayer Chemical. And so, and so the, the, the stock payers, <laughs> the, the stockholders of, of, uh, of uh, Bayer are now wondering why did you ever decide to uh, buy this company that has this huge number of lawsuits pending against them. But this is the chemical, uh, the, this part of the molecule of glycine and this part from phosphate, but it's pronounced glyphosate. Uh, the, there's been a correlation between the use of glyphosate in the United States and the autism rate. So the yellow bars are the autism rate. The, uh, the, the red line is the amount of tons of, of glyphosate applied to corn and soy, which are the crops. It's close to 100% of all soy and corn in the United States are contaminated with uh, glyphosate. And you can see there's virtually a hundred percent correlation. Um, so I think it's very likely that Monsanto eventually will have another big lawsuit in the autism field. Uh, this is the distribution. Uh, so the Midwest of the United States is one of the areas that produces the most food. But there's also some, you see, this is the Central Valley of California. This is all agricultural as well. So these are the areas that have the highest exposure to glyphosate. You can see the one place in the United States there wasn't any glyphosate is the state of Nevada, where Las Vegas is. It's all desert. So there's no crops growing there. So, uh, so it's very safe from uh, glyphosate. And then Roughly 10 years later, you see the Monsanto people were very effective at selling more glyphosate. And now uh, the central part of the United States is very severely uh, contaminated as in, and the Central Valley has gotten uh, in California even more. Uh, so you can see it's only a few of the Western states that don't have much agriculture that are prominently desert that have the uh, problem. And unfortunately for Monsanto, uh, animals exposed to the glyphosate, the female rats develop uh, huge uh, mammary tumors. Uh, and what I suspected is that, that it might play a role in autism and uh, publish this paper about glyphosate being related to uh, clostridia. So the idea is that uh, we saw elevated glyphosate in the triplets, two of which had autism. Uh, two of the males had autism and the female of the triplet had uh, a suspected seizure disorder. And we found that the, these children all had elevated uh, glyphosate. And this is on a logarithmic scale. We put this on a linear scale, it would, the difference would be even more. So these are normal controls, which are around one or one, two or three. The children with autism had values around 30. So nearly 10 times as uh, high as the normal uh, controls. And, and so I think this, you know, that toxic chemicals in general, but also glyphosate specifically are, are major causes of, um, uh, of uh, autism. Uh, and what the reason is because they were, the, the, uh, the mother was of Mexican descent and uh, people in Mexico, their favorite food are corn tortillas, which are, it's, they're like a, a flatbread made of corn 
And of course, all the corn in the United States is contaminated. Uh, so they don't allow glyphosate in Mexico, but of course she was living in, and her children were living in the United States. So they, uh, their favorite food were these corn tortillas. And so they had, uh, I'm sure that's where they had, they got the extremely high glyphosate. So she put them on an organic diet, which means food without any pesticides or herbicides. And, and the child with the highest glyphosate value had a 94%. This is the baseline value. And this was after uh, approximately two months, dropped from 39 to 2.25, which is in the normal range. So people often ask me, well, how do I detox uh, glyphosate? It's real easy, don't eat any contaminated food. If you eat an organic diet, you're not gonna have elevated glyphosate. Uh, and then how do you get rid of these? You follow what those people in the Scandinavian countries, you use uh, uh, sauna treatment is by far the best way, uh, but you need to make sure you have a towel with you. And as you begin to sweat, you wipe it off. If you don't wipe it off, the, the toxic chemicals in the sweat will go right back into your uh, body. Uh, some people also use whole body massages with vegetable oil. Of course, that vegetable oil will be contaminated with all the toxic chemicals. Uh, the B vitamins are also very useful. Uh, I don't have time to go through the biochemical pathways, but suffice it to say that each of those will help in the, uh, in the pathways that are involved in uh, uh, detoxification. Uh, many of the toxic chemicals are removed by glutathione. So uh, 500 milligrams a day is a very good oral dose. The liposomal is probably the best because it's absorbed the best. Uh, you can use intravenous glutathione um, at, at the same dose, 500 to 1,000 milligrams. To me, it's a lot easier just to take it orally, though. Uh, you also want to use uh, only purified water, the best being reverse osmosis or distilled water. Uh, that can be uh, very helpful in getting rid of these. Uh, if you want to see uh, all this data in great detail, uh, look, um, this is the Townsend letter which, which publishes a lot of the uh, holistic and integrative therapies. And, uh, and they have this information online. So you can go to their journal and go to the April 2006. The whole thing is about detoxification. And, and um, it was the detoxification of that happened to the workers after the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Uh, thousands of rescue workers got contaminated with every kind of toxic chemical under the sun. And they showed data that using the sauna and, and so forth that uh, the people uh, invariably became, uh, their health got better. And so they have all kinds of articles that document the improved health. I've talked to a number of the individual who could barely move uh, after that um, exposure during that rescue effort and, and, um, and became completely normal after using the, um, the um, uh, sauna detoxification. This is kind of interesting because there's a, um, a religious sect in the United States that has you know a lot of uh, uh, far out uh, ideas and you know and uh, they have some celebrities like uh, Tom Cruise who's a member of that uh, and even though they have a lot of funny things uh, a funny uh, religious uh, ideas uh, they they paid for the all the uh, fees for the detoxification for all the uh, world health um, for uh, for all of the uh, World Trade Center uh, rescue workers to get sauna treatment. 
so that was uh, uh, very kind of them to, uh, uh, to do that. And so uh, how can you assess toxic chemicals? Oh, by the way, what, as you do this, a lot of times you can actually see the to toxic chemicals on the skin. You'll be yellow or green or black stuff appearing uh, mixed in with your sweat. And sometimes you can even smell it. There was one adult woman who smelled a perfume that she had used when she was a six-year-old that was in her body for you know 25 years. Uh, and she it had a distinct smell that she recognized, had never used it since then, but came out during the uh, sauna treatment. Uh, so the organic acid test, the Krebs cycle markers, especially, uh, especially succinic acid is a marker for toxicity, but also the glutathione marker, pyroglutamic acid, a high value for that would indicate that. And also 2-hydroxybutyric might indicate toxic exposure as well. Uh, the GPL tox has many, and this, this actually has increased, we've added new chemicals. The glyphosate, you have to do a separate test because it is, um, uh, would, would not run on the, uh, on the, the uh, mass spectrometry in instrument. We tried to get it, but it wouldn't. So you have to do a separate test for glyphosate and it's very common for that to be <laughs> in many people. And then the mycotox test is checking for mold toxins in the urine. And uh, so thank you. And uh, I'll take uh, any questions that there may be. We have thank time. you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I, uh, you blow my mind when I sit here and listen to this and also the, the mold uh, lecture that you did uh, about a month ago. It's very, very interesting and it, and it adds uh, another dimension when we look at organic acid testing, like when should we suspect something, when we should we start looking into these uh, things. Questions did come up and I'll try and uh, <laughs> uh, put them together. So uh, some questions came up if you have experience where if there's toxins in different places. So one could be, have you experienced like telates and nutritional supplements like you have in like you noted there was in uh, drugs like medical uh, capsules and yeah so the, the problem is most of these things i don't if they're prescription they they only indicate what the the main drug is but they don't indicate all the um the uh, fillers that are in the the drug so you, you would almost have to if you suspected that, you know, if you had one of these extremely high phthalate values, you might have to contact the manufacturer. And sometimes, you know, they may or may not provide you with that information. Yeah. Uh, but then you, I mean, the way to do it would be if, you know, if you have something there's no explanation for, the only way that you'd be able to find out is stop taking that particular uh, drug. And it can be either prescription or non can be over-the-counter medications that may have this, especially if they say time release. Uh, the, okay. the only way would be to stop it and then redo the test after, say, a week after stopping and seeing if it uh, goes away. Super. So then questions came up like intubators, uh, anesthesia gases, water filters. Uh, yes, so so even water filters are good, you know. So so sometimes even water filters can cause toxicity. Uh, we had a physician who had really severe symptoms, and it was because he had gotten a water filter, and the water filter was using uh, was using uh, iodine as to uh, kill bacteria. And, and so even though iodide is a, an essential element, too much of it is toxic. And so he had that actually toxic levels of uh, iodine uh, in his, uh, I believe it was a hair sample. And it was because of his uh, water filter. 
Uh, but uh, water filters are good. I, I, I would say that the, the best is the, you know, the ones that say they'll perform reverse osmosis. And, and you, don't need, you don't have to have them in your house. I mean, many places, at least in the United States, you can just buy it at the, uh, buy them in giant bottles, uh, big, you know, heavy bottles at the uh, uh, supermarket. Um, yeah, in Europe, a lot of places we believe our water is safe to drink. So you, there isn't a market for selling water like that. But it's probably it's probably not true unless they unless your your water companies are saying that uh, you you have uh, uh, re, you know reverse osmosis, and I I doubt that's going to be the case. So I gave the example of this very wealthy neighborhood in on the beachfront in California where they're all millionaires and and their water was all contaminated. Uh, and just recently, they, uh, they, there was a report of a child who died of the brain eating uh, amoebas because he, the water was contaminated with that uh, organism. I, I think if you really want to be safe, you just invest in, the <coughs> in a filter that produces reverse osmosis. And I know, and you know, there's lots of Lots of the water in, in Europe comes from rivers that are highly contaminated by industrial sites, pharmaceutical companies, and so forth. Um, and, and even here in Denmark, we had to- uh, Pesticides, you know, as well. So 20 years, uh, 25 years ago in Denmark, they promised that gly glyphosate was not something yet that you would find in the water. We use the water, groundwater for, for drinking water. But of course, now it's here. And then uh, recently, I think that's about a year ago, they had found, um, uh, so what would that be? Uh, it's, a, it's a compound that kills yeast and they use it for wood. Uh, oh, and that's yes. found yes. now in the water as well. In, 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 yeah, uh, fungicides. Yes. Yeah, exactly, fungicides. So yeah. we are, we are not we are even though we might have believe we have or at least we're being told that we have clean water, we may not. And again, that's like, who owns your health? And of course, it comes yeah. a question when you purify your water. I can see some of the notes here, like if you distill the water, it takes the, the minerals away and so on. So that's oh, that is an that issue. Kind of, that is an issue if you. That's they with this highly purified water, you need to add minerals back to it. And I thought there, there's a, a matter of fact, I thought of doing that as a, a side business, you know, get uh, a, a mineral supplement that you would add like one packet to each big jug of, of purified water. So uh, especially like one, one, of the, one of the most essential elements is lithium. And the main, the main source of that is water. So if you use purified water, you could have lithium deficiency, which can lead to severe uh, psychiatric issues if mm. your lithium is too low. For sure. I, uh, there's a question came up, like if it's worse in the developed countries, and I can at least add a note in regards to antibiotic resistant drugs that seems to be uh, worse uh, in some of the developing countries um, rather than the countries where there's a lot of focus on organic produce and so on. And so I, I, <laughs> I guess that kind of answers the question, but could, perhaps you can add a few comments to that as well. Well, I, you know, you mentioned about even, even if the water is pure, I mean, so many people, the world has shrunk. So most, you know, many people get all their their fresh vegetables and fruits from other countries. You know, you may be getting, you may be getting oranges from California, the Central Valley of California, or, or, uh, or Florida for that matter. You know, Florida is a big producer of, of uh, oranges in the winter time. Super. So I, I think this is the final question, and it's a very good question. So the main tips regarding reducing toxins, toxic exposure, of course, find out if, if you are exposed and try and understand if there's health issues involved. But otherwise, what? Eat organic, sweat, drink clean water. 
Yeah, yes. Uh, 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 organic is, you know, it's more expensive, but bad health is very expensive. So, so uh, you know, uh, you know, all all the diseases, uh, you know, a lot of the diseases of older people are really not because necessarily because of age, just because older people have accumulated more toxic chemicals than young people. So these things don't are not you know, excreted at a regular basis. So with each, you know, year that you add on to your life, you add a year's worth of toxic chemicals you've been exposed to. And, and studies have actually proved that older people have, you know, proportionally more accumulation of all the toxic chemicals. So, so uh, uh, eating organic, uh, you know, it may, when you're young, maybe you don't think you need it, but if you want to have a good uh, uh, old old age, you, you better uh, invest in the, uh, in eating pure food and also in doing the periodic treatments, uh, the sauna treatments, uh, glutathione are excellent uh, ways of getting uh, getting rid of the stuff. Uh, but um, the uh, organic food is an excellent way of doing that. And uh, ex exercise, you know, that is a can be a substitute for a sauna. If you, but if you ex, so you want to exercise until you develop a good sweat. Sweat is the key. <laughs> but and we have proven that all of the toxic chemicals we measure are found in increased amounts in the sweat after uh, after sauna treatment. So we did some uh, experiments. We hope to publish that uh, at some time in the future. That is very exciting. Okay, I think we have run over way over time, but uh, people <laughs> have been hanging on and listening and asking questions. And now all the thank you and great thanks comes in here. So Dr. Shaw, I will thank you from my heart. Uh, and thank you everyone for staying tuned. Um, and for all your questions. And I'm looking forward to seeing you soon again. And if you have questions, let us know, uh, send an email to us. We will share the um, presentation as we normally do as soon as possible. Um, so thank you for now and a virtual hug from me to you okay. all. Okay, okay, thanks everyone. It was a great you. pleasure. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.